Okay, we're going to go on to how populations evolve. All right, so a little bit of reflection. I know we know what a population is. Population is made up of members of the same species who live in the same place at the same time. And key thing with a population and with evolution is that they can reproduce and have offspring who are viable and can reproduce. So that's a big thing. Evolution is not about individuals, it's about the whole population. Can the population make a next generation and a next generation and a next generation? In a population, if one individual is favored and they don't reproduce, it doesn't have an effect on the overall population. So we really need a lot of them. And again, breeding, fertile offspring, fertile so that their offspring can pass on those traits and pass on the traits and pass on the traits. All right, so we're gonna go over some terms that are important to evolution. The gene pool, it's all the genes that are included in a population right now. The variation of those genes are called alleles. One thing in evolution, I know I touched on it the other day, is the more diverse a population, meaning the more variation in the genes is really good for the population because if the environment changes, you really hope as a population that you have a group who are able to adapt to that change and keep the population going in terms of reproduce, pass on those good genes, and keep the population going. Otherwise, you go extinct if nobody is favored. Sorry, what does allele mean? Allele means the different version of a gene. So the alleles for eye color in humans would be like brown, blue, hazel, green. Yeah, right? So it's just the different versions of a gene. Oh, and we're going to get into it right here, right? Okay, so <laughs> alternate versions of a gene. So here on this, we have a little review about chromosomes and genes. Let me put this stuff up. Oh, okay. So remember, humans in any one of our cells in our body, except for sperm and egg, all the other cells in your body, you have 46 chromosomes. The reason you have 46 chromosomes is because you have two sets of 23. You got 23 chromosomes from your biological mom in the egg, 23 chromosomes from the sperm in your biological dad, 23 and 23 make 46. So with our 46 chromosomes, again, we have 23 pairs. So if we are looking at, let's say, chromosome number one, we have two chromosome number ones. One came from bio mom, one came from bio dad. For any given gene, you may have two of the same genes or you may have two different genes. Just depends on what bio mom contributes and what bio dad contributes. So with these two chromosomes, you have two of the same. We call them homologous chromosomes. There's that H-O-M-O -O again homologous chromosomes. When they are different, we call them heterozygous. If you took 111, this is all like, oh yeah, I remember that. If you didn't take 111, it's okay. We're going to go through some of this soon. All right, so what does that have to do with evolution? Why are we studying chromosomes and genes? Well, we're going to take a look at the idea of complete dominance inheritance and with complete dominance inheritance, you have alleles that are dominant and alleles that are recessive. 
very simple form of inheritance, what we can do is that right now in our population, we can document what percentage of the population have the dominant allele, the recessive allele. We can do that today, take that data down. If we were able to, or maybe we're studying bacteria who reproduce really quickly, look at them today, we look at them in two weeks, and we, again, look at the percentage of dominant alleles and recessive alleles, and if those percentages have greatly changed over many, 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 many generations, we can say, yep, that population has evolved. If they've stayed the same in many, many generations, to that point, we can say, nope, evolution hasn't happened in this period. So we can use this information, genes, the changes in genes over time to see if evolution has happened in a population. So that's what we're going to do with what we call Hardy-Weinberg. But I'm going to give you a little more background about genetics first. Okay. So, oh, so again, if changes in genes happen over time, we can document that. We know that evolution is happening. So again, we're going to study allele frequency, the percentage of an allele in a population at a certain time. That's what we call the allele frequency. So let's take a look at an example. If we have 100 pea plants and they contain 200 alleles for a gene that controls flower color, so here, let me point something out, and this is really critical in understanding what I'm asking in this question. We have 100 individuals, right? We said that for any given trait, if we're looking at 100 individuals for the gene that controls flower color, each individual has two alleles for every trait. You have two genes for every trait. So that is why with 100 individuals, if we're talking about a specific trait, we take 100 times two genes or alleles for that trait, and we're looking at 200 alleles, right? 100 individuals, two alleles for the flower color trait gives us 200 alleles. So make sure when you read a question like that, you're remembering there's two alleles for every trait or two genes for every trait. So if 50 of these 200 alleles code for white flowers, what's the frequency of that allele in the population? So let's take a look. So you're doing a somewhat simple calculation. You're taking 50. You're dividing by what? 200, right? So 50 divided by 200 gives you 25, 0.25. We convert 0.25 to a percentage. We move the decimal place two places, or you're timesing by 100 to get 25%. So what we know in calculating the allele frequency is that that population right now has 25% white allele for flower color. All right, so we're going to look at how does this happen? There's a few other ways that happen. So I'm going to add in a few other ideas or concepts of how genes change over time. Mutations. So remember the other day I said that while like as human nature, we think like mutations are not good. They are both good and bad. What is a mutation? A mutation is a change in the DNA sequence from the original sequence. We do have in our cells, we have checkers. 
just like if you were going to do, and I know it's like so nice now, even on your phone, you send a text, right? You're writing a text and it will put the dots underneath a word that is misspelled. We have spell check in everything right now. That's like your cells. Your, sub, your cells have a spell checker for your nucleotides. When the parent is copying the DNA to either a daughter cell or a sperm or an egg is made and they're making those daughter cells of sperm and egg, we have mechanisms that check over the copying of the nucleotides, just like that spell checker on your text on your cell. We have the ability to stop and repair that. There's really only three really good spell checkers in this process. And it's kind of like if we're looking at making a new cell, you're copying like that notebook that you have in front of you is like that thick, right? So a cell is doing replication into a new cell in a very quick amount of time, less than a day to make a new cell. Do you think if it copied eight of your notebooks in one day, it would make some mistakes? Would it make a lot of mistakes? Probably, right? Even you writing out your objectives and you have three weeks to do it, do you probably make some spelling mistakes? Yeah, probably, right? Try doing, copying that notebook eight times in one day. Are you gonna make tons of mistakes? Your cell has three chances to catch those mistakes. Do you think that your cell will miss some mistakes? Yeah, they're gonna miss some. And those are the mutations that are passed on to the new cell. And when we're talking about the new cell, we're talking about like, you know, like a new eye cell or a new heart cell. If in our body we're making like a new red blood cell and one new red blood cell, it makes so many mistakes that red blood cell is not functional. One cell out of like 2 million that are made that day, is that a big deal? No, right? So not a big deal because you're making so many other cells quickly. If it's an oocyte and it's making an egg and it makes some critical mistakes, is that a big deal? Oh yeah, because then you're gonna talk about either a non-functional egg period or you're talking about an egg that might have mutations that are really bad that cause diseases, but we also could have mistakes that are made that make mutations that are actually more beneficial to that egg. And this is the one thing in biology that we neglect to think about is that we always look at like, oh, the mutation to make something for a disease, right? But what if it makes mutations that make that egg better suited to living in the environment? And it just randomly happens right? When the oocyte is copying all that, it's not like, let's make all of this better for the egg, for our offspring. The cell doesn't work like that. It doesn't have a brain like that, right? So it just randomly is doing its best to make copies. And sometimes those copies go bad, but oftentimes they actually make a little boost in it. So mutations can be and then sometimes it makes mutations that don't do anything. It has a mutation and it still codes for the right protein. So one of the things about mutations is that mutations can be not a big deal. Mutations can be really, really bad, but they can also be really good. So we kind of have those three opportunities that happen in making a new cell. Remember that regardless, when a mutation happens from the parent to making that new cell, those mutations get passed on to the offspring. And again, more critical when we're talking about making sperm and making egg rather than just making like any cell in your body. Okay. So as I mentioned that when you make a mistake in the DNA, remember that we have this process. <laughs> I 
that when the DNA is copied, that our DNA is our genes. Our genes get a transcript into RNA. Our RNA gets translated into proteins. Proteins become other things like other proteins. They become lipids. They become all the important stuff. So while we make proteins, they eventually go through metabolic pathways that become other proteins. They become lipids in our body. They become anything that is important in a cell in our body. So that when you have your genes, they code for your genome, everything about you gets transcripted, gets translated, becomes the protein, I would say like protein, but it really becomes everything that's important in your cell and in your body. We call those traits. And we know that the traits help us with our adaptations. So if you make a mistake there, gets passed on to here, and getting passed on here again could make no big deal, still codes for whatever's important, or codes for something worse, or codes for something better. So just like a little reminder, this is like a lot of the stuff that happens in 111 is going through this stuff to help you get to this stuff. When we're talking about the traits or the adaptations, we call those the phenotypes. So so if we're looking at some possible genotypes from our genes or our DNA, we're talking about like capital T, capital T, capital T, little t, little t, little t. Notice you have two genes for every trait because you have a bio mom and a bio dad. And what we call this, that's the genotypes, that's the phenotypes the physical expression of a trait are your phenotypes. So if you make a mistake on the genotype, you make a mistake on the phenotype, how you physically look. Genotypes are the genes, phenotypes are the physical expression of those genes. So that's what I say, the phenotype, the appearance, how you look based on what your genetic code is. So again, just some like review of that genetic stuff. The cell does not look at the environment and say, hmm, it would be much better if this organism could withstand drought. So I am going to change and make mutations for the offspring because I know that they need to withstand a drought that's happening right now. Uh-uh, doesn't happen. So cells cannot anticipate, meaning that they can't look at the environment and go, I'm gonna change the genes, so I'm gonna make this better right now. It doesn't happen, right? If I told you your life depended on copying that eight times perfectly in the next three hours, do you think you'd survive that? No. Right? You might try, you might try, and in trying, you probably would make a lot of mistakes because you'd be super nervous, right? And you're trying to do this quickly. So it's impossible for them to focus on the anticipation of what's going on. They just copy, copy, copy. It's just like a little factory, and they just do their job without anticipating what's happening around them. Yeah, Andre.
So that's up to you guys to figure out. We're looking at, I mean, and when I say we always mean like, like I'm doing all this, no. Um, that's one of the things that people who go into biochemistry or genetic or genetic engineering, it's a lot of different names for it, genomics. Um, they're looking at going in and fixing those things in the embryos so that the embryos wouldn't be susceptible to heart disease. So it's possibly coming. The problem is, is then when does someone who, you know your kid's gonna have some fatal disease and you want that cured, so they go in, in the embryo and fix it and then they say, what else would you like? How else would you like your kid to look? So then, then we're getting into like weird things that are not necessarily important for the survival of that embryo, right? And so then it's deregulated right now. Can't change embryos in the world. The world has pretty much said like, we're not gonna do that. There's been some things popping up here and there in the news, right? Like somebody said, oh, we created a fixed embryo and we created and we created. And most of the time that's not true. But the problem is, is that we know human nature and where do we draw the line of fixing fatal diseases to making a menu of what we want our children to look like. And so we know humans have a hard time with those lines, <laughs> but it's coming. So big idea here, big, big idea. Mutations are random. They just happen by chance. The cell does not try to fix the genes in a certain way. The cell just does its best to copy the genome quickly. And then they just go, done, I did my job. So anytime a mutation pops up, in a population, it is totally random and by chance. This right here, you might wanna star this because this is really important that you understand this in terms of evolution. So how we got humans who think so well and have such big analytical brains has been random. It's taken four billion years, but we randomly got here. How all the organisms on the earth exist, it's random. Random with influence of the environment. So there's that natural selection and the randomness of mutation and together creates the future of organisms. Cells do not plan to evolve just happens to them. And then they deal with environmental conditions to see what they ended up getting by chance. Does it work in the environment? Okay, so we've talked about this a bunch, right? Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's good. It's not so good that let's say I had a bunch of mutations that my offspring is born with wings instead of arms. We don't get that many mutations at once. It might be a mutation that gives me in my copying of my egg to make my offspring, perhaps there's a mutation that causes my offspring to have the ability to produce more melanin because it changes one protein that causes the production of melanin in my cells and it allows my offspring to have much darker skin, which is a really good thing, especially given the thinning of the ozone layer and more UV rays coming in, that would be a huge benefit to my one offspring to be able to get more melanin and more UV protection. My one offspring who gets more UV protection, does that affect the entire population of humans? No, it's gonna affect their offspring. Is my offspring gonna have like a million offspring to make an influence on the whole population of humans? No, right? We can only have, even in you know best case scenario, we can see that humans 
um, that family that has that, they had that show a while ago that they made like, I don't know, 20 kids or something, right? She was literally at the point that her uterus, if she had one more, it was going to fall out. We just can't have that many offspring, okay? So even that family, even if all the kids, would all the kids probably get that beneficial mutation? No, probably not, right? Maybe one might get it, and that's it. So that's why we say that evolution is not a product of individuals, because my... I might have a beneficial mutation, but it's only important if more in the population have that beneficial mutation, and meaning that it's beneficial in the environment at this time. So hopefully you can see the randomness of evolution, that it really takes a lot of mistakes in going in the same random direction for big changes to be made in a population. So mutation does give the potential for evolutionary change. Is it fast? No. Is it in huge percentage? No. It's slow and it's random. So I know I keep, this is like conceptually while you might be like, yeah, I get it. Make sure you get it tonight and tomorrow and the next day because all of this stuff that I've been talking about is really key. Natural selection is key and this whole mutation thing is key random by chance mutation, natural selection influencing adaptations. So again, this is like the, yeah, mutation can cause change, but only if the environment favors it or not favors it. So when we talk about other forces, the environment natural selection's influence is really huge on whether that mutation stays in the population or is eliminated. So we're talking about big, random things working together. Very complex. So again, if your offspring has a beneficial mutation in the environment at that time, the only way that it's really important in terms of evolution is if they reproduce and their offspring get that mutation too. And then their offspring reproduce and pass on that beneficial mutation too. But again, even two generations later, it's got to be beneficial in the environment right now. So remember, natural selection, nature or the environment selects for what mutations are beneficial right now. What beneficial, what mutations are beneficial right now depends on the percentage in the population, right? If it's beneficial in the environment right now, it's gonna become a higher percentage in the population. So like with the owls, for example, when you have that white and brown owl, when it was snowy, the females will look at the males who are more white and brown and can blend in better. The females will go, I wanna mate with one of those who's more white and brown. And then the brown and beige ones are kind of like trying to just hang on and survive best they can, but the environment changes and now we have less snow. And so then the brown ones can blend in better. And now the females are like, forget you guys. I want to mate with the brown ones who can blend in better. So depending on the environment will depend on what traits are selected for and then go on in greater frequency in the future. Let's take a look at this question. Most commercial pesticides are effective for only about two to three years on average. Take a look at the choices. I want to take a look at B 
first. This is the tricky one. B will be the one, if you don't understand everything that we just went through, a lot of people will choose B who do not fully understand what I just talked about. The chemicals, meaning the pesticides. Do the pesticides cause mutations? No. What causes the mutations? Randomness, right? Just a random mistake that's made in the copying of the DNA. So I will see, if I put this question on an exam, I'll usually see about a quarter of students choose this. And this is the question where I go, they didn't get it. They didn't go over this enough because it's not the chemical. It's not the antibiotic that's causing the mutation. It's random, just randomly happened. So now, which one's the correct answer? Yeah, E is the correct answer. Those with the advantageous mutations. Those pests, those pests, the insects who got the mutations, they got them randomly. And then they were selected for by the environment, which means that they were able to survive easily, reproduce, pass on those good genes in greater quantity. When the pesticide changes, okay, so now three years later, so they've been, these guys have been doing great for three years, passing on that gene for this pesticide. Uh, now this pesticide, we see almost like 100% of the insects are now resistant to this pesticide. So what the farmers do is they work with chemists to make a new pesticide to try and kill these ones off because this isn't working anymore. So now the farmers start spraying a new pesticide. Is this particular mutation advantageous anymore? Nope, right? So now, regardless that they have a resistance to this pesticide, if you change this pesticide, that mutation has no benefit, likely. Now we have to have insects in this population who just randomly are resistant to the new pesticide. If you have none, everybody dies off and the farmers win. All right, so remember, adaptations are based on your genetics. If you have the right genes, you produce the right quote unquote proteins meaning that you have the right adaptations or traits to survive. Adaptations can be how you look, how you physically are inside, meaning your physiology, but also adaptations influence how you act. And this is one that we often forget about, is the behavior part of our genetics, is that our behaviors in general are genetically programmed. So that, for example, when you are born, when you come out, immediately what that team of doctors is doing is they are looking at that baby and they are waiting for that baby to cry. Crying means they have gotten rid of the amniotic fluid out of their lungs and they can breathe air. Because crying will also be like, ah, this hurts, this air, I've been breathing water, now this hurts. So you cry in response to that. And crying goes along with the, I'm breathing air, it hurts. I'm out in the air world, not in the water world. So that is a behavior that infants or babies do when they're born is they cry. No crying means, uh-oh, we either gotta excise the extra amniotic fluid out of the lungs or something else is going on that's not good. So our behaviors are coded for in our DNA also. This is why birds know how to migrate from Canada down to South America. It's just programmed in them. All right, so fitness. 
Fitness is not like I'm going to work out and get more fit. Not in biology. Fitness is how many offspring you contribute to the population. The more offspring you add, the more fit you are, the more fitness you have. So remember that. It's all about contributing offspring. Beneficial mutations, again, generally appear in a population in greater frequency over time. These become important, making sure you pass them on to your offspring and your offspring can make offspring and pass them on again. Remember that natural selection is survival. We also call it survival of the fittest. So two key concepts right here in the description of natural selection is survival of the fittest. You got to survive. And remember that fitness means that you have offspring. So you survive, you pass on your beneficial genes in the environment to your offspring. So sometimes if you know simple meanings of words, but in regard to biology, you're good. Like homologous, right? You know that? You can be like, oh, that means same. I got it. Passing on your genes to your offspring keeps beneficial genes in the gene pool. Remember, the gene pool are all of the genes in a population. So if we are looking at a very similar experiment to what Lab 22 is, is that let's say you have a population of bacteria, you plate them out, you want to see anybody in that population have resistance to a very specific antibiotic. Not every antibiotic, but one specific antibiotic. So what you would do is you take those bacteria and you put them on three different plates. So again, plate them out, plate them out. Put the antibiotic in the agar. And then see, can they survive in the environment of that antibiotic. So that population, does that population have some individuals with resistance to this antibiotic? Yeah, growth, 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 which means that if we're looking at all of these colonies on this plate, these colonies right here, they have individuals who are resistant to that antibiotic. So, a bacterial allele that conveys resistance to the antibiotic streptomycin, give yourself a chance to read this. I'm gonna tell you the one that the student who doesn't fully understand this chooses. A is incorrect. While they have that mutation, what if they never encounter streptomycin? It doesn't, it doesn't do anything for them, right? So having the resistance to streptomycin, is it always beneficial to that bacteria? It is only beneficial when that bacteria is in the presence of streptomycin. Wording, see, see the wording? And that's why I'm giving you guys these questions because the wording is very critical to the meaning in evolution. So what's the correct answer? Good, yeah. So B, it's beneficial to the cell in the presence of streptomycin. So you may have mutations in your cells that you never even know are beneficial to you. Darn, right? Okay, bacteria get resistance to antibiotics. Give yourself a chance to read these.
I'm going to go through each of them and talk about what's good or bad about them. So the first one, because they are in the presence of the antibiotic and mutate to become better suited to living in the environment. Will an organism mutate to be better in the environment right now? No, good. I see a lot of like, no, no, no. Excellent. No, you cannot anticipate as a cell what mutations are going to be beneficial to your organism, and you cannot mutate in that way. So, A, uh uh. Do the antibiotics cause the mutation? No, they do not. The antibiotics will kill you. Whether you have that, well, if you don't have that mutation, you're dead. If you have the mutation, you'll survive. But the antibiotics do not cause the mutation. The mutation is caused by chance. Some of them just happen to have a mutation to the antibiotic already. They just happen to have it. Because that mutation is caused by chance and the copying quickly of the DNA from the parent cell to the offspring cell. So C looks really good to me. Those that have the mutation just by chance already, they survive and they pass on those advantageous genes to their offspring. I like that one. Does the environment influence the bacteria to have the mutation? Again, this one is very similar to that one, just worded differently. No, the environment does not cause or influence a bac- um, an organism to have a mutation. So no, no, no. All right, so the environment only selects for those that already have the traits. I know there's a lot of redundancy in this lecture, but it's all, again, very important. Those that are selected for hopefully reproduce, pass on that beneficial mutation in the greatest frequency in the population over time. Mutations cause a lot of variability in a population. The more differences in a population, the better that population is likely going to survive any change in the environment. If everybody's the same and the environment changes and it doesn't favor anybody because everybody's the same, everybody dies off. So variability, really, really, really good. Okay, we're going to stop there. We're actually going to stop two minutes early for lecture. Oh my gosh, it never happened.